Welcome to Ask Leo AnswerCast number 139. I'm Leo Notenboom, and I'll be answering questions that people have been asking out at AskLeo.com. Today's answer cast is brought to you by me, Ask Leo. I did a bit of an inventory the other day of all the different ways that you can get your questions answered at Ask Leo, and I realized it was a pretty long list. So I want to take this opportunity to remind you of the many ways that Ask Leo is available to you. There is, of course, the AnswerCast that you're listening to right now. Visit AnswerCast.AskLeo.com for complete archives and complete transcripts. There's the weekly Ask Leo newsletter. Visit Newsletter.AskLeo.com to sign up and for complete newsletter archives going back, I think, four or five years. There's the weekly Best of Ask Leo email. Visit bestofaskleo.com to sign up and you'll get a complete hand-selected Ask Leo article sent to your inbox every week. There's Ask Leo on Facebook. Visit askleo.com slash Facebook to visit and like the Ask Leo Facebook page where I actually hang out fairly regularly. There's Ask Leo on YouTube. Visit askleo.com slash YouTube to go to the Ask Leo YouTube channel for a growing collection of video demonstrations of an assortment of my answers. There's Ask Leo on Twitter. Visit askleo.com slash Twitter to go to the Ask Leo Twitter account. Now, I don't post a lot here, but I definitely get notifications when people reach out to me. There's the Ask Leo store. Visit store.askleo.com to purchase Ask Leo books. And, of course, there's askleo.com, a site where you can search and browse, I think, upwards of 5,000 or more answers that I've posted here in the last 10-plus years. I'm certain that one of these many ways will be right for you. I've been told that an external hard drive can still be corrupted after you transfer files, pictures, or whatever. Should I still purchase an external hard drive or get a subscription to a good online service? Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. <laughs> Everything can fail, even the online service. That's why backing up isn't as much about which backup technology you choose as it is about having multiple copies. So there's this golden rule of backups. If there's only one copy, it's not backed up. When you have data backed up, as in you have made additional copies anywhere, then data loss will only happen if both of these copies are destroyed at the same time. How likely is that? Well, if you do it right, not very. Yes, it's possible. So the strategy is really all about reducing the probability of that kind of a disaster. So, of course, yeah, there are things that can go wrong with external drives. They are hard drives after all. They could and can and probably will fail eventually. But if you still have your originals, you just replace the external hard drive and resume backing up. Online services can fail too. Your account could get hacked. Your data could be destroyed. The service could suffer a failure of some sort. The service could even go out of business. But again, you still have your originals and thus you move to a different backing up service and resume backing up. When it comes to backups, it's a numbers game and more is always better. Once again, by having more backups, you reduce the probability that a disaster of all copies being destroyed at the same time would ever happen. But if I could get everyone to just back up to an external hard drive, 99% of the disasters that I do hear about would just go away. So what about that 1%? Well, one rule of thumb is to have three backups in two different locations. That reduces the probability of disaster even more. For example, if you add an online backup service for your data, in addition to backing up your entire machine to an external hard drive, 
then your data is protected from things that could take out both the computer and the external hard drive, like fire or theft. So, no, I personally would not use an online backup as a replacement for backing up to a hard drive. But I do see it, and in fact, I use it myself as an addition to an overall backup strategy to further reduce the possibility of disastrous data loss. If I moved a file to an external drive and then formatted that drive, would that be a way to securely delete the file from my computer? Well, your question could be interpreted in several different ways. So what I want to do is cover several different possibilities. By moving a file to an external disk, I'll assume that you mean you copied the file to that external disk and then deleted that file from your original machine. Now, in a situation like that, the original file may possibly still be undeleted. For example, it could be in the recycle bin. But even if it's deleted from the recycle bin, in other words, even if you uh, clean the recycle bin or empty the recycle bin, then it's still possible, less likely, but possible, that it could still be undeleted. A quick solution to that piece of the puzzle is to use a secure delete program to delete it for real or use a free space wiper after you've deleted the file. Formatting is interesting as there are two different types of formatting. A quick format, which makes very minimal changes to the disk, it actually only erases the root directory and basically marks the entire disk as empty, but it doesn't actually overwrite anything else that's on the drive. As a result, your file could still possibly be recovered. On the other hand, a full format, and you can tell the difference because a full format is going to take a long time, will overwrite everything on the hard drive. Now, while there are techniques that can sometimes recover files from a fully formatted drive, they typically required special equipment and money. Now, when you say formatted the drive, I'm not sure which drive you mean, but realize that a full format is what you would need to use in either case or a free space wiper, which can also usually be configured to even be more thorough than a full format. Free space wipers can usually be configured to overwrite the data multiple times, which is what causes this rare case of data recovery after a full format to even exist. Regardless of which drive it is you're formatting, just remember that the file or the remnants thereof could still be on the other one. I've used Mozilla to enjoy YouTube videos for years without problems. Now I get lots of stops and starts. I checked your article on this and didn't find out how or why the videos played faithfully before, but not now. The problem started about a month ago. AT&T wants me to upgrade. Well, why would I pay more for something that I've enjoyed for years? I'm running Windows 7 and I've tried both IE9 and Mozilla 25 with the same results. I even tried a different computer. I've emptied my cache and deleted my cookies, checked my browser speeds, and so forth. So, what's happening? Is using the internet becoming more demanding of our resources? I could not even watch your videos without starts and stops. Am I going to be forced to pay AT&T more for something I've already enjoyed for years? Well, progress is wonderful, but it can also be kind of painful. And personally, I feel your pain, or more specifically, my pocketbook shares your pain. A megabit per second just isn't what it used to be. Let's look at what you can do before you start shelling out more money. The very first thing to consider is to think about how many devices are sharing your internet connection. If you're like me, what was a single computer or maybe a couple of computers a few years ago now includes multiple computers and tablets and gaming devices and uh, smartphones and even a television or two. If they're doing something on the internet while you're watching your videos, well, that can impact what you're watching. In other words, it can make what's left over, the portion of your internet connection that's left over for you, slower. The same is true for software running on your machine. Lots of software now assumes internet connectivity and, if present, uses it. So check what's running on your machine to see if any of it is, is accessing the network. 
uh, how do I monitor network activity on my Windows 7 machine is an article I wrote that's a good place to start. It'll run you through using a tool to identify which programs on your computer are actually trying to connect to the internet and even transferring data. Switching browsers was a good idea, but I'd also look to see what add-ons are installed in those browsers and perhaps try disabling them. And of course, for completeness, I also have to say that malware could easily be causing this. A spam bot could, for example, be using your internet bandwidth to send spam. And again, what's left over for you then appears to be slower. Now, I'm going to assume that that's not the case, but it's something worth checking out. So, one thing you can control is YouTube itself. YouTube tries to guess what quality of video is appropriate for your internet connection speed. My experience is that they often guess wrong. So, click on the little gear in the video's control bar and then choose a quality that is lower than the one you're currently experiencing problems with. Lower quality might mean a fuzzier picture, but it also means less data trying to get thrown down your internet connection, and thus a greater possibility that it can actually keep up. Ultimately, yeah, technology is advancing and assuming that we have more bandwidth than we used to. What was fast years ago is only adequate today and will clearly be insufficient tomorrow. Like I said, progress is awesome. It's amazing what we can do these days, but it can also be a little painful. My friend has had her Gmail address for maybe five years. She regularly gets emails which are sent to that address, but are from people whom she has never heard of and who obviously don't know her. It's not always the same person. I've had my Gmail address for even longer and I've never, never had such an occurrence. What's going on? This is actually more common than you might think. There are two possibilities, spam and human error. The spam one is easy. Basically what you describe actually sounds a lot like spam, email from people that you've never heard of. Now I'm going to assume from the content that this doesn't look like spam. If it's not trying to sell you anything or get you to click a link or whatnot, then it's probably not spam. Though even the ones that don't look like spam can still sometimes be used as probes to see if an email address might be valid. Now, why she's getting it and you're not? Well, my guess is she may have put her email address out in more public places than you have. For example, if you regularly post your email address in comments on websites or um, in anywhere that could actually get published publicly on the internet, spammers will definitely harvest email addresses from those pages and start sending them spam. Perhaps you've been a little bit more circumspect about how you publish or when you publish your own email address. In reality though, what I really think is going on here is that your friend probably has the, what I call the curse of having a simple email address. The email address consists of a relatively common last name at gmail.com. My guess is that people are intending to email others with that last name and just getting it wrong. Typing it wrong is just one possibility. In fact, it reminds me of years ago when we had a phone number that was one digit off from our local poison control line. People would be calling us thinking that they were reaching poison control. That same kind of thing can happen with email. They could just be getting it off. Making assumptions is another. A lot of people will assume that, well, this person's name is such and such, therefore their email address is probably such and such. But people make mistakes. My Gmail address, for example, actually isn't really all that common, and yet I still get occasional email that is clearly targeted at someone else or someone who apparently can't even type his own email address in correctly. Now, there's a temptation to reply to correct people's errors. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm too cynical, but I actually don't recommend that. You really don't have any idea who you're talking to. 
And ultimately, as I said, you could be giving spammers more ammunition that says, you know what, this email address we sent email to, it's real. There's a real person reading it. So let's send it some more spam. Leo, I am terrified of getting a virus or some form of malware by clicking on a photo on the web, such as an, e an image in Google Image Search or on a forum where someone has posted a thumbnail image to a larger photo. I frequent a photo sharing website and asked the webmaster about this and he sent me this reply. Well, technically speaking, a picture cannot contain malware. A picture can contain malicious code, which can only be executed by computers which are already infected with a special virus designed to execute that malicious code. The name of that virus is Perun, and it's more a proof of concept than an actual virus. If you'd like to be on the safe side, I suggest you look for freeware online to verify that you're not infected with a Perun virus. Then you can click any photo you want on the web and not worry about catching anything. Now, I use Google Chrome as my default browser, and I frequently use the right-click search Google for this image feature and find the highest resolution of a photo. I have even installed the VirusTotal.com VT Chromizer extension to my browser and use it to pre-scan every photo. But still, just the act of right-clicking a thumbnail image worries me. Please help me. Am I worrying for no reason, or am I at risk? This actually turns out to be an interesting question for a number of reasons. The answer is, pragmatically, no. You're not going to get malware from a picture, and it's not something I worry about at all. However, behind that answer are a few very important assumptions that I think people need to understand. This type of thing is one of the big reasons that people in my position keep insisting that you keep your operating system and your applications up to date. That means running Windows updates, accepting the updates, that means taking application updates and patches, and it also means driver updates. Here's why. It is possible that if there is a bug in the software that displays images, anywhere from the web browser itself to the operating system to the video drivers or elsewhere, that in some rare cases, that bug could be exploited by a maliciously crafted image. You don't need to be already infected. You just have to have unpatched software in a world where there's a known vulnerability. So, theoretically, it actually is possible, and I believe that years ago it was actually done. You didn't have to click on anything. You didn't have to do anything other than display an image, which would then actually take advantage of this vulnerability that was in, I think, the display driver that could then be used to infect your machine with malware. But if you keep your machine up to date, it is still nothing that I would worry about at all. Like I said, theoretically possible if the stars align correctly, but practically, no, this isn't happening and it's not something that I worry about. However, there is a part of your scenario that actually does concern me just a little bit more. It's not a big thing, but it's something worth being aware of. I actually have a love-hate relationship with Google Image Search. It is awesome to find images. As you say, finding the maximum resolution version of an image that you happen to have is, in fact, a very useful way to use Google Image Search. My personal problem is that many people use the images that they find on the Internet without any regard for copyright. Image Search makes that even easier. More to the point, however, is that typically the images you find through Google Image Search will be hosted on websites that you've never heard of. So, how do you know that those sites are trustworthy? The answer is, you don't. So if you visit them, it's not the pictures that'll get you. It's the sites that host them. If you land on a malicious website, they could, in fact, do bad things to your machine. Yes, Google pre-screens somewhat. I get that. But ultimately, you still don't really know. As a result, visiting those sites are what could get you into trouble. 
And if you're prepared, this actually doesn't concern me a lot either. What do I mean by prepared? Well, first, make sure that you have up-to-date anti-malware protection. In other words, an antivirus program, an anti-spyware program, and so forth. And mean that, make sure that both the programs themselves are up-to-date, the most current versions, and that they are downloading database updates regularly, ideally daily. In some cases, it's even more often. Yours is a specific case where I would make sure that at least one of your tools, your antivirus tool, has its real-time scanning turned on. What that means is that it's scanning what you download and the sites that you visit. So that if you visit something that attempts to download something malicious, the anti-malware tool will catch it. Second, make sure <laughs> that you're using common sense. If a website hosting an image seems in the least bit suspicious to you, don't visit it, period. There's also a case where a website reputation service, such as Web of Trust, can come in handy. It'll help you determine whether or not a website is potentially dangerous before you visit. Ultimately, by and large, as long as you follow the standard steps to staying safe online, I really don't think you need to worry. All these PC online technicians say your computer is infected, you need to pay at least $100 to have us fix it like new. They told me that even if I go to factory settings, it won't help. Now I've got running McAfee security, and I do full scans, and I have no virus. Is the internet just packed with tricksters? You know, to be honest, the very direct answer to your question is yes. Yes, there are a lot of scams and misleading advertisements out there. That's why there's one skill that I believe strongly that everyone needs to develop. You need to be skeptical. You need to question everything. The most blatant are the tools and utilities that promise a free computer scam. Now, that's not a lie. The scan is absolutely free. The advertisement or for whatever you're getting this information is quite accurate. The scan is free. However, the resulting scans then fall into two buckets. There's the legitimate. The scan accurately reports real things that it does find and then offers to fix them for you for a price. Or they can be fake. The scan spends some amount of time doing something, and then it, well, it lies. It tells you about all sorts of things you don't have and offers to fix them for you for a price. Even the legitimate tools can fall into some questionable buckets. For example, in the interest of selling their services, scans that honestly aren't lying will sometimes embellish the truth they'll make things seem worse than they really are. For example, they might report hundreds of so-called tracking cookies and do so in a way that makes them seem much worse than they are. They sometimes make it seem like they're a horrible security risk when A, that's a matter of opinion, not fact, and B, in my opinion, it's wrong. So it's at least wrong to present it in such a scary and overblown manner only to try and encourage you, to use a nice term, to purchase their product. So how do you know what's real? How do you know you're not getting ripped off? Well, in many cases, you simply can't. In particular, when you have a properly operating machine and you are faced with some kind of message that says your machine is horribly infected and we can fix it for a price, be very, very skeptical. Take a breath. If your machine is working well, that's data that says the message might just be misleading. Even if your machine is having troubles, well, there's a plethora of free tools and advice sites that can often help direct you to a solution. Sometimes that solution might even be a paid product. And that's fantastic. There are good paid products out there.
It's fantastic if you arrive at that conclusion based on the opinions of resources that you know and trust. Sometimes the solution is simply education. Maybe those cookies aren't so horrible after all. And maybe you can just ignore that frightening warning. And even if you decide you want to act on something like cookies, a good resource will point you at free tools, like CCleaner in this case, that'll help manage the issue. Be it cookies or system issues or malware, there are plenty of good solutions out there. Unfortunately, there are plenty of not-so-good solutions out there as well. And unfortunately, those not-so-good solutions, from scams to scareware, tarnish the reputation of every legitimate commercial solution that might be out there. That's it for today. I do the Ask Leo AnswerCast every week, so if you have a question about your computer or the Internet or technology, start by going out to askleo.com to search for your answer or to ask your question. You might hear it answered here in a future answer cast. I also put out a newsletter every week. The Ask Leo newsletter includes answers and fixes and safety tips and opinions and all sorts of good stuff, and even the occasional answers to just why things are the way they are. Please, please, please back up. You know, I plug this every week because it's so incredibly important. I can't overstate how important it is. Nothing can save you from almost any disaster like a proper and recent backup. Please realize that all of my answers are based on my own personal experience and should be used entirely at your own risk. I just don't know you, your abilities, or the specifics of your machine, and those kinds of details can make all the difference. The Ask Leo Answer Cast is a production of Ask Leo and is copyright 2014. Thanks for listening. I'm Leo Notenboom, and I'll be back soon with another Ask Leo Answer Cast. Mm-hmm.